Okay. Uh, and the third, 95% the of third. species. And the fourth, okay. it was about 75, it's bad. So right? this is like 250 million years ago, 255 million uh, years ago? The fourth was 200. The third was 255. That's the one I wanted to ask about. Yeah. Let's start at the third. So what, what caused the third? Um, there's an example. There's um, There was a, uh, a, a guy named uh, Bishop Usher. He was the uh, the primate of Ireland, which I learned is a religious title, not his simian origins. But okay. he was. Uh, <laughs> we gotta check that with YouTube monetization. Just to be clear. He was like a, he was a, an archbishop yeah. in Ireland, and he decides uh, this is in the the sixteen uh, hundreds, I believe. Um, he decides he's going to figure out how old the Earth is, and he has no tools. Right, geology hasn't been invented. It hadn't been invented at all. Not really. No. Uh, that comes around, uh, um, James Hutton publishes Theory of the Earth in, at the very end of the, uh, 19, uh, the 1700s. So, so we don't have geology. We obviously don't have any kind of lab tools to date rocks or anything like that. So he doesn't have much to work with. He's an archbishop, so he's got the Bible, right? So he does some historical research, and he, he figures out the date of King Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. in the Bible. And so he's got a starting date there. And then he goes back through all the all the bagats in the Bible, you know, and so he works his way back through the generations, back to Adam and Eve, and he determines that the earth was created um, in 4004 BC on October 23rd, around 6 p.m. Hmm. on a Saturday. Oh, we landed on the time too. Yeah. Wow. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. Now, you can laugh at that, especially because it's absurdly specific, but what Usher did was he created a testable hypothesis, yeah. right? And we have tested that hypothesis and we have falsified it. Hmm. But it was a credible piece of scholarship, I think, and we falsified his hypothesis and, and that's what we call progress. Did he say how he got the time? Did he ever like give a good answer? I don't know how he or got did the he say, time like, of God the day. Told me that I'm was the time. Not really sure. God feels like a post happy hour kind of guy, right? <laughs> Maybe that, that might be it. Yeah, you know, we weren't drinking at five and creating the earth. We waited till after <laughs> everyone left the bar. That makes sense. No, but it's it, it's it's a it's almost like an extreme example, but this it's another great yeah. example of of what I'm getting at. It's and like, so I mean, scientists are people. Yep. Right? We have. We have our time and our careers and, and, you know, maybe our egos invested into things, but... They have ego in science? They don't have A that. few of them do. <laughs> yeah, not me personally, but some of them, you know. Um, but, and so this is hard to do, but the proper response of a scientist, if your idea is falsified, you say like, great, we've made progress. Yes. Right? And it's the ultimate... Again, that's like another paradox with human nature because your ego is like, but does that mean I'm full of shit? Which is not the case, but that's how things will get painted. Like, oh, you were the guy that was wrong. But that that's the whole point. You're supposed yeah. to try to explore the unexplored and figure out what that is. I, and I think we should celebrate that. I said on, I think, the Discovery Channel like 25 years ago, I you know, that that we would never recover ancient molecules because of all these reasons why they would never survive, they would they would degrade over time. Well, we did. We right? did. Can you explain that? And I was wrong about that. And so, you know, my, I'm a scientist. Thank you for coming clean. Well, scientists change their view when yes. they get new information. That's right. That's what makes science different than politics. That's what makes science different than religion, right? I mean, how many times have you had a, a political argument with somebody where like you have like this killer fact mm -hmm. and it doesn't change a thing, right? Or how often does an event happen in the world or a new discovery in the world and how often does that change religion? It, it doesn't. It doesn't. Right? But it does science because that's what science is, right? And that's what makes it different. Mm. Yeah, and, and I, wish, I wish everyone could think that way because we, we have seen – you know, especially over the past couple of decades, people from outside the space, I might add, in many cases, turn science into like the new religion and stuff like that. And the whole, again, it, it, it takes things and suddenly defines stuff as law. And then you're not questioning, you know, whether or not we can test something. And, and it exists across all elements of science. And I talk with all the guys I bring in here about it because it's so, it's so counterintuitive to me. It's like we should constantly be testing questions. And if something is then proven as like, oh, that's not right, then great. We've made progress, just like you said. Yeah. So go, going back to 
dinosaurs though and we, we were talking about the fourth extinction when that yeah. happened mm -hmm. what what I, you might have mentioned this but i just want to make sure we rehash it what what exactly caused the fourth extinction where i think you said 95 percent of species were wiped out uh like and the third 95 percent of third. species and the fourth okay. was uh, about 75 is bad so right? this is like 250 million years ago 255 million uh, years the ago? fourth was 200 the third was 255 that's the one I wanted to ask about. Yeah. Let's start at the third. So what, what caused the third extinction? Yeah, we call this the great dying. Um, there's a couple of things. That, actually, there's a lot of things that are going wrong on the planet at this time. Um, one is that people think, you know, a lot of people know the word Pangea, right, the supercontinent, and they think that that's how continents started. It's not how continents started. It just happens to be like a moment in time when all the continents happen to bump into each other. Right. Right. And so they were separate before. Um, and there were different continents before, there were different oceans before. Um, but at one point in time, all the continents bump into each other and we have Pangea. That's hard on life. Um, continental climates are extreme. Think about the middle of Siberia. It could be 100 degrees in the summer and it could be, you know, minus 50 degrees in the Crazy. winter, right? Yeah. So continental climates are extreme. And then when the continents are all together, all the organisms have to compete with all the other organisms. You know some of the problems we have with invasive species today. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because an organism from over there is now competing with the organisms over here. But when the continents push all the organisms together, it's just hard on life. So, so we're in a rough time to begin with. Mm. And then these giant volcanic fissures in what is now Siberia open up and issue forth vast quantities of greenhouse gases. And we get into this like runaway um, greenhouse effect and the planet just heats up um, and everything tremendously dies. and and the combination of all those things is just too hard on life and 95 percent of species perish whoa yeah and so we were pointing out that a lot of the species that perish include dinosaurs and this was during the era where the dinosaurs were like cat like size you said not yet you've moved not ahead yet. one I'm yeah ahead we one. don't have dinosaurs yet so while you're here Ken, you got to keep me on order <laughs> yeah so this is a world before dinosaurs this is the end of the paleozoic okay um so pre-dinosaur world and this sets the stage for the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, have you ever seen those, those little cute fossils called trilobites? They're very common. You buy them in rock shops and you can go on, you can find trilobites. Maybe I've seen one. I just can't look remember on the Etsy term. And you'll see okay. like jewelry made of trilobites, but they, they go extinct at the end of, of the uh, Paleozoic and lots of other things do. Uh, there you go, trilobites. So they had a oh, great, yeah. Yeah, I've a seen that. great run across the Paleozoic and then uh, they can't hack it uh, when this happens, and lots of other things go extinct as well. Got it. Um, but it set the stage for the dinosaurs. It set the stage eventually for the dinosaurs. Kind of set the stage more for the crocodiles, and then the next one set the stage for the dinosaurs. Okay, and the crocodiles, these are the ones that are bipedal you were talking about? Some were. Uh, there were other ones that you know were, were quadrupeds, but they were huge and scary and, yeah. Now, how like, – because – I've talked with some other people about this, about how we as humans look at time. I, I was talking with Gnostic Informant about this. I, I don't know the exact term, but it's almost like there's an exponential correction that we do in our heads. And what I mean by that is we look at something that's attainable to look at, meaning like we have video of it, for example, of like the 1940s. And it seems very long ago. Mm -hmm. But then as we go farther, maybe we go 200 years back before that, we view that on a similar layer as we viewed the past 80 years. And then from 200 years, we look at the 600 years before that, and we view that like almost in the same time period to the point that, you know, we could be talking about something that happened in 65 AD and compare it to something that happened in 168 AD. And in our heads, we're like, oh, it's similar time. Yet right. It's yeah. like five generations apart yeah. and shit changed and everything. Absolutely. So when we're looking at evolution, I get caught in that trap all the time because you almost like picture like, oh, just walked out of the water and boom, there it is. But how long after that extinction, like what was the process of the first crocodile forming and how long did it take to grow to size? Uh, you know, on a human time scale, it's, it's an immense amount of time. I mean, it, you know. You think about events that happened here on Earth a thousand years ago and it seems so long ago. But it's right? nothing. But it's, it's nothing geologically, right? A thousand years is like, you know, 500 oak trees. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, it's to us, to our perception, these things move at a rate that's not perceivable. Mm. Right. Geologically, you know, when you look at the whole fossil record, you can see things that look like they're happening very rapidly. But, you know, our senses are tuned for the here and now, right? Like we are. We're very good at perceiving 
threats, food, and mates, right? Yes. We're not so good at perceiving things that unfold over years, definitely not decades. It's one of the reasons why, why people aren't, I think, as alarmed as we should be about the climate crisis. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.